I'm Ali Shakuri, professor of electrical engineering at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I teach a course in renewable energy sources and in sustainable engineering. So I guess we have prepared uh, some uh, uh, material, an overview of what are renewables, what we can do, you know, as a, a single homeowner or uh, somebody who lives in a small town, uh, but also related to the big picture of what's happening uh, in the world in the term of the energy challenge. So the uh, first view graph that I have is um, just to give you an idea of where we are in our energy consumption. What you see here is energy consumption in the world in terms of how much liquid, this is oil, coal, natural gas we are using, renewables and nuclear between 1990 and you know 2035. These are predictions by Department of Energy and what you see is that you know they are saying renewables will double in the next 25 years and nuclear also they think will double we will have to see but even with those you still see the use of fossil fuels is keep going up is not coming down um, so that's a challenge that we need to look at the second um, issue is uh, the numbers so how much energy the world is consuming today is 13 terawatts and this terawatts it's a million million watts is a lot is a big number and I guess when we deal with big numbers, how to get a feeling of, you know, how my, you know, turning on a heater will change anything in the world and what these numbers mean. So first, I wanted to introduce these energy units in a form that maybe uh, you can connect it um, to everyday usage. Um, so this view graph will show instead of using energy units of big numbers, do it per, per person and per person use a unit of kilowatt hour. Kilowatt hour is a unit that you can relate to if you have a 40 watt light bulb and you turn it on for 24 hours, the energy it consumes is one kilowatt hour. So that gives you an idea. 40 watt light bulb on for 24 uh, four hours this is how much energy it consumes. Then you can write everything else as a function of this kilowatt hour. So a food that we eat typically is about uh, three kilowatt hour. So it's like having three 40 watt light bulb on for 24 hours this is how much energy is in the food. Uh, taking a bath is about five kilowatt hour. I guess it depends how long is this, how hot it is, but you know, this is average number. This is, I guess, from a British uh, text. It says a liter of petrol is 10 kilowatt hour. A gallon is 4.5 liters. So a gallon of uh, uh, gas that you put in the car and you burn it is 45 kilowatt hour. So it's like having 45 light bulbs on for 24 hours. And the typical aluminum can has 0.6 kilowatt hour. This is the energy to make the aluminum. So it gives you an idea when you throw away one can of aluminum, how much is it comparing to um, what, uh, you know, how much eat, food you eat or you take a car and, and things like that. So you can connect these better. In a typical life, uh, these are the numbers. What you see is, um, for example, driving 62 miles on a typical, you know, 30 miles per gallon car is 80 kilowatt hour per day. Running a house is about 80 kilowatt hour per day also. Taking one trip to Europe and coming back per year is equivalent to 26 kilowatt hour per day. So now you can connect the energy consumption with different activities all together and uh, you can see how these numbers add up. Um, so you see the huge impact, you know, the air uh, travel has, uh, you know, one trip and this is driving every day, keeping a house, how much food we eat and so on are actually on the uh, small side of it, you know, a typical cell phone charger is 0 0.01 kilowatt hour per day. So now that you have some ideas about this um, energy units, you get a, a feeling of where the energy is used. Here are energy consumption for an average person in UK and you just double it to find what is in US. Now in the same unit of 120 uh, the kilowatt hour. So the number in UK or most of the Europe is about 120, in US is 250. And about one third in transport, one third in heating water and air, um, and the rest of it is you know, lighting appliances and so on. So this is the energy that we consume. <laughs> Um, so typical US person consumes 25 kilo, uh, 250 kilowatt hour per day. And if you want to see how does it correspond to uh, CO2 emission, you just divide it by 10. So basically as person in US every uh, uh, day consumes this much, so every year produces something on the order of 25 tons of CO2. So that's kind of the number 
uh, that we need to change. Why is it this much of carbon emission? Because energy that we use come from burning fossil fuels, either in the case of um, petroleum or uh, you know coal in coal power plants um, uh, and other sources. So these are the numbers. Where is U.S. comparing to the rest of the world? Again, these numbers are CO2 emission uh, per person, and then you can compare different countries. Here, horizontal axis, the population, the bigger countries is bigger population. U.S. is here. We are not the worst country. Uh, Canada and Australia consume more energy per person. But these are the three exceptions. The rest of the world, Europeans is about half of us is here. China and India are here. And uh, you know, China today is about five or six uh, uh, tons of CO2 per person emission, and India is even less. Right now, the world average is five or six tons of CO2 per person. There is a lot of discussions in international relations that people tell you, um, uh, well, uh, we need to bring this down. We are consuming too much energy. We are emitting too much CO2. But China is growing. And how we could accommodate it so that we are still competitive. But one thing uh, people forget is the scale of the change we need to do. If we want to have an um, uh, increase in temperature less than 2 degrees by uh, the end of the century, we need to bring the average for the world to a number which is here, 2 or 3. So it's not a question of uh, which one should go up, which one should go down. All of these needs should go down. And that's kind of the biggest challenge we have. And as you saw, even doubling the renewables or even tripling will not solve this problem of uh, these countries consuming a lot. And these countries want to have a lifestyle comparing to us here. And um, uh, so that's a huge challenge that we have. So what are the renewables we have and how they could ha solve this uh, carbon emission problem, climate problem? Some people say, well, look at history. Things have changed. You know, in US, <coughs> this is energy consumption. In 1850s, most of the energy came from wood. It took another, you know, 100 years in 1920s. Uh, coal was the major source of energy. Then 1970s, our major source of energy was petroleum. At the same time, natural gas came about. You see nuclear power rising uh, after 1960s, and hydroelectric is somewhere down there. So you say, well, and transformations happen, and this is something we think may, we have a problem, so in the future, the other sources should come in. But if you look at this picture, you see that the change in energy um, sources happen, but they are over uh, you know, half a century or so. And the challenge we have is that the uh, change we need for mm, uh, solving our climate problem need to happen in the next 20, 25 years. We don't have that much time. So that's the issue of uh, renewable energies. Right now, what they are is that the photovoltaic production, wind energy, ethanol, this is biofuel, everything is going up. These are the numbers for 2009. Um, Again, when you have lots of zeros, you kind of you don't know how to compare them. But just to give you an idea uh, is that the energy consumption in the whole world in 2009 was about uh, 14 terawatts. So in this unit here is this. So 14,000 gigawatt. This is the total energy we consumed last year, and this is how much renewables contributed. So you see, it's, it's a long way. Uh, it's a fraction of a percent or so. So. Things are improving, you know, the costs are coming down. This is cost per kilowatt hour. They levelize it, so they take the lifetime into account. 1980s, it was about 30 cents per kilowatt hour for wind. Now it's down to five or six cents. Photovoltaics have come down significantly, geothermal and so on. So, you know, one possibility is to look at these numbers and say, well, things are going in the right direction. If we just continue this, uh, eventually we will solve our energy problem. One of the analogies that people give is uh, the big revolution we have had uh, in computers. Uh, many of you have uh, remembered the first computers in 1980s and how the computers today they are. This is versus the number of transistors in a chip in the brain of the computer. And basically every two, three years it has doubled. And you see it's significant increase over a um, long period of time. And uh, some people are saying this is what human ingenuity could do. Uh, when we put our brain to it, we can make marvels. We can have laptops and cell phones that we can access the whole internet. All we have to do is to apply the same type of motivation to uh, green energy. A comment that I guess Bruce will talk later on about it is that this analogy, you have to take it with a grain of salt. 
There have been other advances in our life. This is airplane speed, how it changed between 1900 to 2000. From the time of the Wright brothers to 1950s, we had a good exponential increase. And if you look at any of the magazines, uh, science fiction magazine 1950s, they said by year 2000, you can have your breakfast in Los Angeles and lunch in New York and you know, dinner in Paris and come back. Um, that has not happened. The speed of the commercial transport is the same in the last 50 years. And so you see, this is a case where technology has had very good exponential improvement, but then it's saturated. Is it aeronautic engineers, you know, were less smart than electrical engineers who were computer designers? Uh, the answer is, uh, when you deal with information, um, there is much more things you could do. And here we are limited by some of the physical laws. And Bruce will talk about that. Some people say, well, the speed doesn't matter. There is no economic incentive. That's the reason companies, they don't um, uh, work on it. Do you know any startups working on the next, you know, Boeing or whatever that would travel twice as fast. I mean, there are discussions, Concord went out of business, and airline companies saying, well, if they give you internet when you're in your seat, that's all you need, and you can, you're willing to stay five hours in your seat, it's not a problem. But if you look at what is the bottom line for the business, is the amount of energy needed to transport a person. This is a kind of a technical unit, a megajoules per available seat kilometers. But this is a number that tells you, this is the bottom line, this is how much fuel airlines consume to transport you. And again, if you look at the numbers, technology advanced between 1920s to 1950s, the number came down. Then jet, jet engine came in, the number went up. Why? Because fuel was so cheap, people they didn't care about the fuel consumption. But it's getting better in the last 40, 50 years, but it's, you know, one or two percent a year. It's not order of magnitude. It's not <coughs> what you see with transistors. And I think this is the analogy we should remember for our energy system. Our energy system are limited by physical laws, um, and uh, that's a challenge. It's not that we cannot do anything, we just need to be aware of it. We need about 20, 25 terawatt of energy. Different renewables have different uh, uh, amount of energy that is available. Let me start with hydroelectric. Me, we know about dams. You put a dam on a river, it generates electricity when the water falls down. Technically uh, feasible or economically feasible is 0.9 terawatt, and it's already 0.6 terawatt installed. So there's just not enough rivers and dams to solve our energy problem. Look at this 20 number there with one here. Let's look at geothermal. Geothermal is the energy of the heat in the uh, ground. If you add all of the surfaces of the earth, the amount of energy is huge, it's 12 terawatt. But um, uh, the density is so low that it's very hard uh, to um, make it economical. A geothermal <laughs> well, basically what you do is that you make a hole in the ground, you send water, and if the water goes down five to 10 kilometers, it can heat up to 200 degrees Celsius. It boils and it can come down, turn the turbine and generate electricity. The problem is typical well would run out of the steam in five years. And typical wells generate about five megawatt, while a Saudi oil well generates 500 megawatt. So you have to make 100 times more of the geothermal wells to just replace one uh, oil well. And that gives you the challenge on the geothermal. In the oceans, we have, you know, here is on the beach, uh, we see water moving. The amount of energy in the water's total is about two terawatts. It's a lot, but comparing to the 20 terawatt we need, it cannot solve all of the problem. And this is assuming, you know, you put something in front of all of the beaches and everything to take the energy from the wave and ocean currents, and that's not practical either, it's very expensive. That remains to be seen. Right now, the, among the cheapest renewables is wind, and in the places that is windy, it makes a lot of sense, it's the cheapest, but the total extractable, people estimate it is two to four terawatt. Uh, if you go back to biomass, this is the energy we get from the plant. Um, there have been a lot of discussions. Um, this is the amount that, uh, if we use all cultivated land not used for food, this is how much we could generate. The biggest problem is agriculture is not just energy from the sun and energy out. You need water, you need fertilizer, you need to uh, pay attention to the ecosystem. So this is a significant issue, but because the fuel that you can get from a plant is similar to oil and you can put it in the car without too much changes for the car companies, without too much changes for the, you know, um, um, 
gas stations, people are spending a lot of time on this, a lot of energy. But this is not something that could solve our problem. Really, the main source we have is the sun itself. Uh, every year we get about 600 terawatt, and this is uh, much more than we have. The problem with the sun or solar panels is that uh, the efficiencies and the costs are right now too high. And the second part of it is, um, is intermittent, uh, like actually many others, like wind and ocean and so on. And uh, you cannot say we will have a, a, a panel today if there is a nice and sunny day, there is enough energy for the camera. And if not, you know, just hold your time and we will uh, have it as soon as the sun comes out. You know, we cannot make our life like that. So that's a big uh, challenge for the energy side that we have. So here is an overview of the uh, renewables. I don't want to go over each one of these. If you have questions, I have view graph on each one of these and I can go over more details. Let me um, show these numbers of the renewables in another form. Here is um, energy density, basically energy per unit area. And I think this is a good way to compare different energy sources versus the actual area in meter square. Um, and this number is logarithmic, is a big change. So this is 100,000, 10,000, 1,000, 100, uh, 10, 1, and so on. Here is the energy we get from oil fields. Oil fields are on the order of a uh, million meters square or 100 million. They have energy densities of 1,000 to 10,000 watts. So a meter square, 3 by 3 feet uh, of an oil field can generate this much watt of energy. Coal fields are similar. Here are phytomass is the biomass plants, is this little. Hydroelectric is here, wind here, tidal and um, geothermal are here. Uh, photovoltaic and concentrated photovoltaic are here. So the best renewables we have, which is energy from the sun, are a factor of 100 less dilute, less dense, more dilute than um, the conventional fossil sources. And I think that's the challenge that uh, we should appreciate. Um, so when we think about renewables, the first uh, message is fossil fuels have excellent energy characteristics. We are going to replace something which is very good from an energy point of view with something which is much more diffuse. Of course, these are not clean and they have so much problems for our climate, but that's, you know, that doesn't tell about their energy potential. So right now, wind and geothermal are among the cheapest of the renewables, but there's potential for significant growth. Uh, but they cannot solve our energy problem, that we know. Uh, solar has the potential, but currently is expensive and is intermittent. And for the intermittency, there is no clear option for large-scale energy storage. We don't <coughs> have that. You know, some people say just you know, take water and pump it to some storage and take it down, or compressed air and so on. But if you look at the numbers, uh, we don't have enough reservoirs, and it takes a huge amount, and it's not economical. So storage is a key issue. Biomass has the potential to provide part of the transportation because the energy that is needed for your house is different from the energy that you need to carry with you. So biomass is a potential. Now the research is what they call it cellulosic biofuels and algae. These are startup companies who develop these. Uh, we don't know yet the full ecosystem impact. We don't know yet the uh, cost and so on. The corn ethanol, and, uh, uh, like in U.S., and uh, ethanol from sugarcane in Brazil are already commercial, so it's happening. Um, so, and I think for certain countries, certain regions, uh, for, I guess, labor reasons, for, uh, I guess, uh, farmers to have jobs, uh, it makes sense to do some of it, but this cannot solve all of our energy problem, and we need to uh, pay attention to that. So if our goal is to have a planet with everybody has a lifestyle so similar to what, what we can enjoy here, uh, it's clear that we cannot do this by just working on the supply side alone. It's not just, you know, somebody invents a better solar cell tomorrow and then day after tomorrow you will not hear about energy problem anymore. The, the, uh, the, how much we have to go and how much energy we need is quite significant gap. Energy efficiency is important, but we also could, should consider changes in the lifestyle, city planning, social structure, and I think that's one of the areas where um, uh, there could be significant impact. Um, you know, you hear a lot about the way houses are built are to minimize the cost to the builder. 
but the way they are run and how much electricity bill or you know gas bill you have you know it's something they don't care as much and as long as these two are independent uh, there's not much uh, improvement we could do in the designs so there are things that uh, people have to do in order to combine this so what we are doing uh, now on the practical side so you saw the big picture you saw that uh, energy is a problem global warming will have uh, will not be solved if we cannot replace the fossil fuels but you saw that renewables as they are growing they cannot answer this, uh, our energy need at least not in the short term uh, so i guess our approach have been uh, you know uh, our asset at the university is our students we have uh, developed a series of courses uh, in sustainability engineering and renewable energies water agriculture and social change just to uh, teach students what are these issues. We try to connect these classes through community project because I think students appreciate much more uh, the value of the work they are doing if they see a real impact in the society. I give you a couple of these class projects and I think anybody here who wants to be involved, that's a great opportunity. Um, we want <coughs> students to work on the real problems and uh, so anybody has any sustainability or energy related issue in their business or their home and they think is a problem, uh, we can give it to our students. Um, so we, we are developing a textbook. We hope that this actually could be used in other universities. We are one of the pioneers in, um, in US that are bringing for the first time lots of people from engineering to people in social sciences. And I think this is an area where the communication has been lacking. Uh, division of work is good, is good. Each person is uh, uh, expert in one field. But um, if you, uh, somebody is designing a, the next generation laptop or iPad, you don't need to do significant social change, you know, or significant understanding of the social. If there's a good product, people buy it. So for that kind of applications, it's good for technical people to work with some artists and some others and make the next generation. But energy uh, problems we have is not just you take something and you put it on everybody's house. You need to think the, the way people live, the, the, the way people uh, use energy. And the problem is actually most of the time people don't think about that. And this is not in our conscience. You know, we pay attention to food we eat, you know, calories it has. But when we consume electricity that is coming from coal, suddenly it doesn't make, you know, black uh, part of our skin that we realize. It, you know, it's kind of we hear that is bad, but, you know, we don't uh, see it. Um, we had a visitor actually from England, Elizabeth Shove, who is a social scientist. Uh, she made an interesting observation. So if you consider the issue of comfort, it's becoming normal to expect 22 degrees Celsius inside all year around, all over the world, whatever is outside temperature. 22 <laughs> degrees Celsius is 70 degrees Fahrenheit or something like this. And you know, today if you design a house, you say, well, this is the way it should be. It should have the air conditioning if it's in a desert or, you know, it should have a good... Uh, heating system so that it's constant. But what she says, if you look at in the history, for many centuries we lived without a constant temperature. And actually in the early 1920s, um, uh, companies had a hard time selling air conditioning machines because people thought they could become sick. They wanted the fresh air. They did a lot of um, work in terms of, uh, you know, of course, improving the design so that, you know, you don't have fungus uh, growing on the machine. But the idea that the temperature should be constant for you to be comfortable itself, we could question it. And this itself has a huge impact on our energy consumption. Uh, and uh, <coughs> so she gave other examples, showering, and this is actually quite interesting. She has a book about comfort, cleanliness, and convenience. And you think, you know, uh, whatever we do, typically one or two daily showers is the way we should do, and this is the, you know, the better for our body. But she gives examples of how things in history <coughs> have changed, and, you know, she gave examples in 16th, 17th century. It was actually considered a good thing not to be uh, immersed in water because they thought that you, you get uh, uh, sick through your skin and your skin is somehow permeable to water and you know now uh, if you don't bother when we take you know two or three times uh, showers every day there are other examples about laundry uh, so i think this is the kind of examples that could allow us to rethink actually the way what we consider as really comfort and i think these will have better impacts uh, or much deeper impacts than just saying, okay, let's have a, you know, a smart thermometer that uh, adjusts it so that if somebody in the room, uh, the uh, air conditioning comes up, and if you go out, the air conditioning just comes down. But the whole goal is to keep the temperature constant. You know, these are 
incremental improvement, these are more fundamental improvement. But we cannot do this kind of change without you know, social scientists and uh, psychologists thinking what really um, make people happy. One other thing uh, that we are doing um, uh, at UCSC is the international collaboration. And we have a um, summer school with a couple of Danish universities, uh, Technical University of Denmark, Alberg University, with uh, UC Santa Cruz, UC Davis. We take students from Denmark and uh, uh, from UC uh, to site visits, visits um, uh, various renewable energy installations. This is a waste incineration plant in Denmark, second largest offshore wind uh, farm in the southern part of Denmark. And I think these visiting just these facilities and seeing what is the real work involved to generate electricity uh, is a great learning experience for our students. So for example, the uh, manager for this plant took us in one of these boats and gave us a tour of this plant. And he was explaining, you, you know, you think you put these uh, towers in the middle of the ocean and they run and nicely get elec green electricity, you know, for 25 years for free. And that's not the case. Each one of these have a one week mandatory maintenance per year. They have somebody to go inside, you know, clean it up, change things. And in addition, uh, uh, they have sensors, something goes off, they need to send a ship. One person, you know, take the ladder, go up and uh, clear it up. And the average, each one of these uh, is visited um, uh, five or six times a year. Every five or six years, they need to hire somebody who go on top of each of these turbines and inspect it for lightning damage. Because even if there's a tiny damage and they detect it, they can easily cover it. But if they don't, the damage grows up and it could break this. So it's not easy to think that you just take the energy of the wind for free. Uh, it's interesting, I asked him so uh, how it is uh, for you and he says, well, we have this uh, agreement with the Danish government to, to install this uh, uh, wind farm, uh, have it for 20, 25 years, and then we have to take it out from the sea. I said, wow, that's interesting. So what are, you know, what is the payback time? And he said, well, I cannot give you the numbers. This is, you know, business uh, competition issues. But typically it's known it takes about 10 years to get, each of these turbines is about two, three million euros. Uh, so it takes about 10 years to get the cost down. I said, mm, that's good. How about the maintenance cost? He said, no, I cannot talk about that. <laughs> so it's, so it's uh, kind of give you an idea of where we are going and what are the challenges. This is the, uh, we, we had a visit in the state capital, uh, this is Fred Keeley, he, he told us about some of the policy issues that has happened in Sacramento and what are the problems. Uh, actually, California, in a sense, have been at the forefront of the policy. Uh, what was interesting for me is that when I visited Denmark, I always view Europe and Denmark as the countries that promote a lot um, uh, renewables and they care a lot, but they actually see example from California and they said some of the laws that we passed in the uh, 1980s and our, for example, AB 32, Assembly Bill 32 for uh, climate change and so on are really very progressive, so they uh, um, uh, look at uh, what we are doing quite closely. Unfortunately, I guess our example is not followed as much the rest of the U.S. And I think it's a challenge of each of you is that why is it? And why is it that um, uh, how we can spread the idea? So just to finish up, I wanted to give you a little of um, some of the uh, things that uh, well, our students are doing. For example, one of the projects we are working is a Green Wharf project. This is a collaboration, again, between engineering and environmental studies with the city. And the idea is that what it takes to make the wharf green. They are setting up in one of the roofs um, uh, on the wharf a system that measures the wind and the solar intensity and record the data. And um, they want to look at the energy usage on the wharf. Um, they look at energy generation. How can you generate electricity on the wharf from waves? Uh, there is actually not many com commercial examples of wave energy generation, so they want to have a small test uh, to see how much energy is there. Um, <clears throat> What they have done, so but is the idea is that the wharf itself generates about, uh, consumes about one megawatt. So if we make the wharf fully uh, on renewable energies, that's more than 50% of the Santa Cruz 2020 carbon <coughs> reduction goal. So that's a reason the city is working with the university. Right now, uh, they are doing some coastal commission permits. They have obtained a preliminary permit. They are doing some sensors. 
um, but they want to also discuss about smart grids. We can go over the smart grids later on if there are questions. Uh, but it's important to build a community support. Many of you have seen this building that is being built on the base on the wharf. It's called uh, Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary Explorerium. And we are thinking about how we can showcase some of these uh, renewable energy technologies uh, or the research we are doing at the university at this place. Uh, Cabrillo College has a, a program in construction and energy management, and they have a specific courses on solar PV design and installation, solar thermal design and installation. Um, they have a whole you know, certificate that you can go through it, so that's a good opportunity for those of you who actually want to do something in your house and your, uh, your uh, neighborhood uh, to um, benefit from and learn uh, what is done uh, could be done for your, by yourself. I guess the question is how we can spread it in the community is um, uh, we need support groups in the community. So what you know each of you could do or each of us could do, we need to spread the word about some of the challenges and some of the possibilities. We still need to educate people. Um, uh, there are a lot of resources on the web, but it could be also very confusing. Uh, if, if somebody wants to do a solar thermal installation on the web and you just Google, you know, solar thermal installation, you find, you know, 10,000 documents. Which one of them is really working for you? What is good for you here? What happens is that if you go to local classes like the one at Cabrillo, they really teach you things that are applied here. But in Europe, they have do-yourself groups. And these are groups that basically find what works for them, you know, when you want to buy pipes, the pipes that are available in your neighborhood may be different than the one that is available in Australia. And you cannot just download a document from Australia and do it here. So they do it in cities and they, people got, get together. And if one person installs a solar uh, thermal installation, they tell, oh, I did it this, I tried this component, didn't work, this thing broke down, and this worked. And that actually helped to spread the knowledge. And some of the countries that they have seen the highest installation of solar thermal system by residential in Austria. And Austria you know, doesn't have much uh, sun. Why it happened there? Because of these groups that came together and each taught the neighbor what they could do. And uh, at the end, they were able to build it. I want to give a comparison between US and Europe. Here is the photovoltaic market size 2006 to 2010 in certain units and here the bottom one is Germany then the green is rest of the Europe and then rest of the world and then USA is the uh, is maroon here and the green is Japan so you see how things have grown Germany itself is installing as much solar panels as the rest of the world mm -hmm. and look at the US is here, Germany is here. Population of US is 300 some million, Germany population is 70 million. So it's smaller countries, uh, but they invest in that. Some people, uh, they don't even realize the challenge they have. This is the solar radiation in US, this is solar radiation in Germany. And the red, the more red it is, the more solar radiation you have. Of course, you know, places like Arizona and Nevada have lots of solar in California as well. This is the US. And this is Germany. And Germany is like the same solar radiation as Alaska. So with that resource of solar, they are willing to spend money and uh, do such a huge installations. Why they do that? And I think that becomes sometimes also a, a misconception. Oh, it's just a matter of cost. If you make it cheap enough, they will do it. Well, they do it at this climate with the current cost. The reason they do it is that they see this as an opportunity for growth. They see energy needs to be uh, changed to renewable, and if we do, they do it themselves, they develop the industry themselves, and they're ahead of the game. And I think that's kind of the view that we need to have uh, in terms of what uh, we could do here. This is the amount of CO2 emission for um, USA and uh, developing countries, and this is the amount of CO2 emission for the rest of the world developing countries. These are some projections, and I have a lot of uh, kind of comments about why these projections I don't think are valid. But what some people say is that because population in US and the developing countries are more or less stable, uh, but the developing countries are hugely growing, no matter what you do here, uh, we are doomed. So that's one way of looking at it. I don't think that's the case. The emerging economics is the red, and the black one is the total. So basically it says the total is really dominated by China, India, and Brazil, and these countries, so why we bother to do anything? I'm Bruce Sawhill. Um, I am a complex systems scientist, and uh, my background is originally theoretical physics, but I've always had an interest in energy issues, and uh, 
What I work for now in my professional life is a, I'm a chief scientist in a small consulting research company that works in the area of aviation. We've been engaged by the FAA and NASA to think about how the U.S. airspace will be used in uh, 2030 to 2060, so the far future, the transition, the transition future time frame. And, uh, well, you might think that, well, if we run out of oil, there won't be any aviation at all. And the problem is quite simple, but I think there actually will still be aviation and uh, how it unfolds will be interesting. So I think about how systems evolve. I think about um, ecological, economic systems, coupled systems that are financial and ecological, for instance, and uh, not just how to envision a different kind of system, the airspace or a sustainable future, but how you get there. Because if you can't, if you can imagine something, but you can't imagine a path there, it's as good as non-existent. I've been looking at the Transition website, and uh, you may think that you're here to learn something from me, but I'm actually here to learn something from you. What I understand from Transition, at least how it started originally, is that it started in England, where some people started imagining what that, A, there will be a thing called peak oil. Well, oil will become scarcer and more expensive in the future, and this will trigger enormous changes in how we live. So life will change for us, perhaps radically. And uh, are we going to go back to the 1930s, uh, back to the 19th century? Um, reading people like Kunstler and others, it seems to be a kind of yearning for a 19th century lifestyle of a, of a village life and fields just beyond the village and the clop of horses' hooves and the clanging from the blacksmith's shop and uh, good food cooking somewhere. Um, we're going to go back to the 14th century, maybe not as attractive, the Black Plague, turbulence, death and despair, um, or back to the Stone Age. Um, this is important to think about. Or, since we can't go backward, what are we going to go forward to? And what I would like to do is examine some assumptions about, about this, particularly about peak oil, but other assumptions that seem to be associated with the transition philosophy. I wanted to ask some questions of you. Um, and I'll explain why I'm going to ask these questions. Uh, a lot of the kind of what comes up in these seminars is what can I do myself? Well, how can I make a difference myself? And a lot of things are things you can do at home, grow a garden, put solar panels. And I thought, well, how many people here own their own homes? And you see a show of hands. About, about half, which is about actually the Santa Cruz average. I think it's about 52% and the national average is about 63% down from 66 or 68 due to the mortgage crisis. What I'm asking these questions is I want to under understand what other people think of as a transition. So there is this thing called a transition that presumably caused you people to show up here. And I want to find out from the horse's mouth what people think it is. So. How many people think that life would be better after the transition? How many think a transition can be accomplished smoothly? And uh, how, many think, how many people think technology will be or play a critical role in transition? Interesting. Okay. How many people think a, a transition will be accomplished smoothly, even if it can or cannot? <laughs> not, not very many. <laughs> um, it's a painting I saw a while ago. It's fairly poorly painted, but um, there's a sort of long-standing philosophy throughout human history, which is millennialism, that there will be some huge transformative event, a transition, and this depicts the, the rapture, the second coming of Christ, and that these are all death events. This is, by the way, the aircraft hitting the building. This was painted before 9-11. Um, so... Um, these are all souls ascending to heaven. And that this, this kind of thought appears throughout history and a lot in American history, that there will be some sort of enormous event and that um, the dead shall be judged and that the, that the downtrodden shall be raised and that justice will be done. And I realized that in reading some of the literature around um, transition, that there is a little bit of this woven in there by, by some writers and that um, it can be a dangerous, a dangerous line of thought to think, why, why is one actually doing this? It's important to keep asking why. At the physics lecture hall at Stanford, um, there was somebody had put up above the, the desk where the professors did demonstrations, keep asking why, and somebody had written in pencil underneath, you are here. <laughs> so it's, just, it's good to keep asking. Um, so the big assumption, number one, um, I don't know if you can see the cartoon, but it says fuel and it says obsolete. 
uh, <laughs> the bottom left there. So the transition will be forced by peak oil. This seems to be a, a common thread and that oil is critical to transportation as we know it. Um, it's not so critical to a lot of other things as you saw on Ali's slides. We get a lot of our energy from coal and nuclear for other purposes, but the oil is primarily used for transportation. And historically, back through many centuries, that uh, prosperity is associated with trade, is associated with transportation. That things in Europe didn't really start to prosper until people started trading and the rise of the Hanseatic League. What will happen when <laughs> petroleum gets scarcer and more expensive? So transport must do some combination of things. Use less of it, become less energy intensive. Um, water and rail use a lot less energy per unit of stuff moved than road and air. Um, so will we, and those are kind of 19th century modes of transportation. Will we go back to using things like that? Um, another thing is slow down. That if you go twice as fast, if you take a trip from A to B in general and you do it twice as fast, it doesn't use twice as much energy. It uses four times as much energy. It goes a, as the square of how fast you go. Actually, the amount of power required to do a trip goes as the cube, but it takes half as long, so eight, then divided by two gives you four, but it's, it's bad. That's the, that's the take home, <laughs> is that going fast consumes a lot of energy. So will the world, future world be slower? Uh, possibly. Use energy resources other than petroleum. Um, renewable would be nice. Uh, there are a lot of issues with that that I'll get into, and there are technology challenges. So yes, perhaps we could generate enough renewable electricity to do our transportation electrically, but then how do you store it? And uh, how do you store enough of it in a place to be practical? This comes up in my work because we're thinking about a future of electric aircraft. Um, it's difficult now to make electric cars and the power requirements for electric aircraft <laughs> are even higher. Become less common, so just don't do it. Just, just stay home. And this has many ramifications. Uh, it means that there's a lot of extraneous transportation that perhaps isn't needed. Perhaps we can become more local in our use of resources, but there are issues with that that I'll get to. Um, and perhaps we don't, we have the will to create and use alternative energy, but we don't have the money. And I'll get into this too, um, that the, the issues in the future may not be necessarily technical, but they could end up being financial, which is about social, uh, social organization. Here's a possible future. Um, Somebody had a little bit of sense of humor that got milk because they <laughs> presume that starvation will be an issue. Um, this is about 10 years old, but it's a, a rough peak oil graph and uh, things look pretty bad on the right hand downside. Um, and this is, this is a transition, but it's a transition to somewhere presumably we don't want to go. This is, what I, this is maybe what the transition to the 14th century would look like. The reason I brought the 14th century is that, up is that pretty much for the last thousand years or more, human population has increased steadily. With an exception, between 1300 and 1400, human population went down quite a lot, especially in Europe, by about 50%. And uh, there was a lot of societal disruption associated with this. And it's associated with the Black Plague, the Black Plague was more a symptom than a cause. The fact was is that there was a what's called a little ice age. It got a little cooler. Crops weren't as good or as steady. There was a lot of starvation. People were weaker and they were prone to infection and the Black Plague found a place to flourish. So it's a long line of causality. Um, this is the kind of crash that probably uh, happened in the 14th century. Uh, here's another future that seems perhaps the kind of English bucolic 19th century vision of uh, what a transition world might look like. And uh, I would argue that it's probably not going to be either of these. <laughs> it might have aspects of both plus, plus other things. So I want to talk under some more historical perspective and perhaps a little bit closer. Um, the last big uh, energy revolution was World War II. And World War II wasn't, of course, about an energy revolution. The subject was defeat global tyranny. And people, I think, generally would agree that the result was positive. Uh, as somebody once said, mission accomplished. And I think it actually was in this case. But it had a lot of unintended consequences. And some of those are that um, we figured out how to run everything on petroleum, um, that we the mobility and the portability of uh, petroleum powered engines uh, required a lot of development because 
uh, the feeling it was a competitive environment where, where the stakes were extremely high. Um, the Allies had more ex access to petroleum and electricity. That there is a saying that the Germans are building planes, uh, let's see, that the, the Germans were building planes as fast as we could shoot them down, but the Americans were building planes faster than the Germans could shoot them down. And what made the difference was the, largely the hydroelectric power on the Columbia River and refining bauxite to make aluminum to make those planes. Uh, some of these things can be very critical at the right time. Um, I would say that the oil age began at this point. Um, oil was being used before that, but not so uh, extreme. But another unintended consequence that didn't have anything to do with technology was that 46% of the food consumed in the U.S. was homegrown, mostly in victory gardens, little backyard plots. And so this is a lesson in how fast a remarkable transition can happen if you have the right incentives. This was amazingly fast, and 46% of food is an enormous effect. So the long view, and I believe Ali showed the same slide, um, it's the history of energy consumption in the United States. There's two things to notice. The first thing that jumps out is that there's pretty much nothing going on until the 20th century, and then it just takes off. But there's another thing that's less subtle. It does take off, and there's this exponential rise, but then it sort of saturates around 1970 or so. And um, we know that petroleum may be saturated because there was the Arab oil embargo and we started running into limits and it started becoming more expensive. But other sources did too. So even though we have an enormous appetite for energy, it doesn't appear that we have an unlimited appetite for energy. And furthermore, even though those quantities have stagnated in the last 30 to 40 years, the economy has not. There's been about a three time, factor of three real growth in the economy in that amount of time, which means that there is a correlation between how much fossil fuel you burn and how much wealth you create, but it's not causality. In other words, you don't have to burn a certain amount of carbon for every dollar. It's not a direct relation. And in fact, the amount of <coughs> wealth created per unit carbon has improved a great deal and per kilowatt hour, so whether it comes from carbon sources or not. So this, this makes one realize that, yes, energy is driving the economy, but it's not a simple relation. So the next great energy revolution is that figure out how to run everything on renewable electricity, just as we figured out how to run everything on petroleum uh, 70 years ago, except things that don't need high quality energy. I'm going to talk about what quality means in this case. And it turns out there are many of those things. In fact, it's like talking about non-elephant zoology. It's the most, it's the big part of zoology. So the things that don't require high quality energy um, are the majority. Things like hot water and uh, space heating. Uh, Ali re referred to this also in his slides that this is about 40 to 50% of all the energy consumption in the world is heating water and heating space. So energy quality. Energy comes in many different forms, that it can be chemical, electrical, gravitational, thermal, etc. And uh, the quality is related to how transportable it is and how transmutable it is. Um, the most transportable energy we have is oil, that it can be pumped out of the ground in Saudi Arabia, loaded on ships, transported very cheaply because shipping is very energy efficient, and burned over in the United States, you can go around the world with a fairly small loss, fairly small energy cost to cause it to go from one place to another. Electricity is almost as good. Um, you can't create it in Saudi Arabia and use it here. Uh, wires lose too much power. <coughs> we don't really have practical superconducting power lines yet. But you can move it halfway across the U.S. You can generate power from the um, hydroelectric plants on the Columbia River. Some of that is used here. It can be generated in Arizona, New Mexico. Some of that's used in Southern California. So it can go considerable distance. Um, and then there's thermal energy, which is you know, just like the uh, <coughs> putting something dark out in the sun and it gets hot. Well, you can't really transport that at all, not very easily. So you pretty much have to use that where it's created. That's sort of low quality energy. Electricity and petroleum are very high quality energy. So maybe you don't, maybe you don't actually, you need to match the energy type to its use. Um, and uh, electricity is sort of like money. 
that it's you can exchange it for lots of things so you can have electricity turn a, an engine uh, you can have electricity heat some water you can have electricity turn water into hydrogen and oxygen a chemical analysis a chemical result so it's uh, it's sort of like money you can exchange it for anything um, that makes it ex sort of like the top of the pyramid fungible means tradable you can ch exchange it for things and it's sort of transportable as I said you know a thousand miles or so um, but there's a there's an interesting corollary of things that are transportable that let's you know maybe some of you saw the Beverly Hillbillies a long time ago and Jed Clampett sees the um, <laughs> the oil coming out of the ground well let's say that Oklahoma somebody sees oil coming out of the ground just like that and so oil is I don't know $113 a barrel now well let's say it comes right out of the ground and all you have to do is pour it into a barrel and you could sell it for a dollar a barrel well they won't. They'll sell it for $113 a barrel because it's a worldwide market and because it's easily transportable. So there, um, you have this very high quality energy has also an association that there's a world market for it. That what's happening in other parts of the world affect what's happening here. So yes, even if you were able to get <coughs> oil in an unlimited quantity, it would be very expensive here because it's very expensive somewhere else. Um, low quality energy doesn't have this issue. Uh, if you're able to heat your house with low quality energy, it doesn't affect anything in the world economy. There's also this notion that if you have high quality things like petroleum or electricity, there's what I call the crooked money lender. Every time you turn energy into something else. So that every time you burn petroleum to move pistons, to move wheels, every time there's an exchange of form of energy um, from oil to thermal to kinetic you lose some it's, this is the second law of thermodynamics but I call it the crooked money lender you you never you never get your money's worth you say can I have change for a 20 and you get a five and three ones and you say what's up with that and they say oh, that's, that's how we do business <laughs> and, uh, and there's no way out so you don't want to exchange you don't want to convert energy too many times you want to keep it in its original form if at all possible and use it as is so low hanging fruit, this is getting toward the direction of what can you do? So do the easy part first. Um, 50 to 70%, I checked in a number of places, of household energy requirements can be replaced by low quality energy. So heating water and heating air doesn't require fancy technology, doesn't require um, turbines or uh, even photovoltaic solar cells or uh, even fancy expensive batteries with lots of rare elements in them. It's, um, it's quite simple and low tech. And so in some sense there's no conversion fees. You're taking heat directly from the sun, maybe concentrating it by having it land on something of a dark color and using that to heat water and air. So there are low tech solutions that don't require too sophisticated of materials, maybe solar um, collectors that are made out of aluminum and copper and rubber, which um, you know are indeed resources but they are often recycled and they are not so expensive. And uh, there's a book called Other Homes and Garbage that first described how to do all this by Gil Masters and several others at Stanford. And I think it's still one of the best uh, books out on this subject. And uh, Ali might have some other recommendations. He uh, has mentioned some books to me too. Um, and uh, it's a do-it-yourselfable thing. And if you're able to reduce so we talked about supply and demand. Can you get all the energy you need from renewable resources? Act on the supply side and act on the demand side. So the supply side is yes, you, you cover New Mexico with solar cells or solar panels, but the demand side is that you, since there's a low quality energy, namely solar thermal, is something you can only use at home and it's inexpensive to generate, why not do that? Then you don't need so to cover so much of New Mexico with solar cells. Don't create the demand in the first place. And that you can make a big difference this way. That about 40% of all of the energy usage in the world is space heating and water heating. So that's an enormous difference that you can make. Um, and uh, low quality energy can come from the sun and the earth, active and passive. Active means a solar collector and maybe pumping water through it and using that to heat space and water. Passive is designing a house so that it um, either collects solar energy or is shaded from it, depending on where you are. And uh, 
my metaphor for using electricity to do things like this that's generated with fossil fuels is using a violin to pound nails. It's a very expensive, very high level, high quality thing, a violin, and you wouldn't use it to pound nails. You would use something blunter and simpler. Um, so it's easy to get the first 50%. I, I think I didn't mention anywhere here that the Kyoto Protocols say to reduce carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. Well, it's pretty easy to get the first 50%. Um, I think that we're so profligate in our energy usage that it would be relatively affordable to make that level of change. It will be harder to get the next 30%. That's going to require more technology. But order matters. This is the systems thinking that, um, yes, it's, it's nifty to have a lot of photovoltaics and maybe windmills and things like that. But if you spend all your money on that, you might end up in an economy where you don't have enough money to do the things that really make the difference. So it's important to do the things that are less expensive, more cost effective, and make it make a big difference first, because that enables you to keep on keeping on, both individually and as a culture. Assumption number two that I seem to run into in the transition literature is that local everything, that you want to go from, from this, this highly intensive, enormous scale agriculture, to this. Uh, like community supported agriculture or backyard gardening. The claim is that we eat food from very far away and that uses a lot of energy to get to us. Well, the, the actual facts are that transportation energy itself that uses petroleum is about 4% of the energy required to produce food. Um, it's about, yeah, about 4%. Um, so petroleum fueled transport is not the main problem. It's not so much where food comes from but how it's produced. Um, so what uses energy and these other things, irrigation, fertilizer, cultivation, um, all require machinery, pumps. But irrigation, for instance, could use low quality energy. Um, irrigation doesn't have to be on demand. It could be when the wind blows. The, the Dutch figured this out, how to use windmills to move water around, and uh, it's, it's clearly proven technology. Fertilizer is the big deal. Um, it's derived directly from petroleum. When we eat a lot of foods, they have molecules that started out their life in an oil well in them because that fertilizer, the petroleum was converted to fertilizer, nitrogen fixing, which was put into the soil and the plants grew it and, and we eat it. So we are eating oil quite literally. Um, this is a big problem. I think it's probably a bigger problem than the kind of energy that Ali and I have been talking about, which is electricity and heat and transportation. Um, the energetics associated with food, I think, is going to be a more difficult societal problem to solve than the energetics associated with um, running, running computers and uh, keeping us warm or cool and moving us around. Um, sustainable few, food is a bigger problem. Topsoil, water, nutrients are all things that are being depleted. Um, so food is energy and a different flavor, calories, and I think Ali mentioned that too. People who look at what it would take to have sustainable topsoil, sustainable water, nutrients, and uh, do calculations as to how many people can the world support long term. And you can tell that it's an immature science because the, vary, the estimates vary all over the map. Uh, it's from 0 0.6 to 4 billion. Well, <laughs> those numbers are less than where we are now. We're just getting near 7 billion. So um, this, is, this is a problem and that how it's, we know that, I don't know who it said, somebody in the 80s said, anything that cannot continue on forever stops. And uh, this is something that's not going to be able to continue on forever. So it's just a question as to how it's going to stop. Stopping having children for 40 years is not the solution because while well, everybody's 40 years older and then <laughs> nobody's, very few people are able to have children after that. And then you have this very aged population and uh, it's, it's uh, when they teach you, when you're, when you're learning how to fly, they teach you don't make any gross motions. Uh, don't, don't push the yoke forward or back very hard. Everything is gradual. You don't, you don't change altitude like this. You change altitude very gradually, and then you come on to a new altitude. And uh, we have to figure out if it's at all possible, and maybe for fundamental sociological reasons it isn't, how to get the society f down to numbers like four billion. Um, the longer time you have, the easier it is. Uh, if you look at literature from the 60s and 70s, the predictions as to what the population would be now are already far off. Um, 
they were saying nine billion by now in the 60s or even more, even 11 or 12 billion. Well, we're not there. It's clearly curving a lot. Um, and various things have made the difference. The number of children per woman in India, for instance, has gone from six to two and a half. And that's a very short amount of time. That's as profound a change as the 46% of food being grown in your backyard over World War II that with the right incentives, society can do profound things very fast. An uncontrolled decline. Well, when did the population last decline? I mentioned that, it was the 14th century. It was not a good time to be around. And that an uncontrolled decline sinks all boats in a connected world. That the vision of living in a happy village with the clop of horses and all that, while everybody else is dying around you, is, is not realistic. By and large, in the argument of localism and food, it's a good idea to tend your own garden, as Voltaire said in Candide. Um, that seems a win-win situation, and that is something you can do at home, and that is something that makes a difference. And it's not because the food is close, it's because of how it's raised. Um, so local is not automatically good in that case, but things that are raised, food that's raised without extensive fertilization and uh, cultivation, machine cultivation and, and such, and irrigation, um, that makes the difference more than transportation. So localism for energy. Well, can you go from a big centralized power plant to a roof covered with solar cells and is this the best way to go? Um, well, as I mentioned before, low quality energy cannot be transported easily. So it's good to produce and use that at home cheaply. The payback time for solar thermal systems where you, you get thermal energy from the sun is less than 10 years. This is, this is worth doing. It can actually save you real money. You don't do it just because of altruism, because it feels good for the world, because you can brag to your neighbors. It actually makes a financial difference as well as being warm and comfortable. Um, high quality renewable energy, however, might often be best imported, um, even though solar panels on your roof look cool. They're economies of scale. They, uh, it turns out that solar thermal plants, where you have a lot of mirrors collect solar power, like this and focus them on um, places where you heat up some working fluid and use that to drive a turbine. Um, those are not practical at home. Uh, those work better on a bigger scale and they work better in places where there's lots of sun like the Mojave Desert. Um, they're economies of scale. They can be far away but not too far away because you lose um, basically about every time you cross a state line you use, lose about 10% of electric power in transmission. So. Um, maybe in another part of the same state, but not in another country. Uh, deserts are sunny and hot, not so great to live in. Um, it requires access to capital and technology, why some of these things need to be centralized. But in the future, you might be able to participate in future energy systems by buying shares. Um, it's like buying a share in a CSA. You might buy a, a share in a community supported power plant that has um, guaranteed supply of supply of power at a certain price and uh, kind of this will make people when people are invested in things um, you get a lot you can align incentives a lot better so having community having the feeling that the community owns and is responsible for its power generation and usage can make a big difference another thing that might happen in the future is a way of solving the renewable uh, energy storage issue um, if photovoltaics get to the point where they're inexpensive enough to produce electricity at, in competitive rates, there's still the storage issue. Well, batteries aren't very cost effective because it's just very expensive to get a reasonable amount of storage. But if you got something else for that, like being able to drive around, well then people would pay a lot for batteries. So people may become micro utilities in that they own small parts of the power grid, namely the battery in their car and that there might be a time when you need a lot of excess powers being produced and that you get a little notice on your iPhone saying, we'll pay 70 cents a kilowatt hour if you park your car and charge its battery because we might want to use that, buy that power back from you later. And so people might become individual utilities. And so the thing to do is the bang for buck, which is low quality energy used at home and higher quality energy um, <clears throat> perhaps produced elsewhere, but have a vested interest in it. That is a goal to work for. So a modest proposal, with apologies to Jonathan Swift, is that perhaps the challenges are not really technical. Um, things are getting cheaper. We're figuring out how to do various kinds of alternative energy, how to build solar collectors, organic gardening, 
They might be social and economic challenges. It's not reskilling of a cult of a of individual people, but of a culture. How do we work together socially and insi align incentives, um, the financial and political, to accomplish these goals? Um, World War II is an example I come back to again and again because it 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 was an astonishing mobilization of human effort in the United States and performed amazing things in a short amount of time and that it is possible. So not saying that such a thing could happen, but it has happened. So the biggest difference between any two numbers is between zero and one and something that happens once means that it could happen again. Um, you need to learn from past cultures. There's a book by Jared Diamond, not just Guns, Germs and Steel, but his book called Collapse which is a narrative of cultures that made it and didn't make it for ecological reasons, mostly ecological reasons, more than political. And a book by Ponting called A Green History of the World, which also talks a similar thing, but with a more direct focus on ecology. Um, Lessons of World War II, it's the power of aligned incentives and it's about hearts and minds rather than so much about um, building certain technologies. There are some economic social challenges associated with this. We live in a world that's essentially full. We have more people, really, than the world can support. So everything is used. Recycle, you know, everywhere good is occupied. I get also the feeling from the transition literature that there's a desire to go, go to a beautiful green field and create a new energy efficient, socially equitable town. But the fact is that everywhere you'd like to do this already has towns. So we're living somewhere, we're living in a world where everything we need to do is recycled. So we have to get very good at recycling. Um, and what do you do with a hundred million houses that were built with oil energy, hugely inefficient, perhaps too inexpensive to fix, too expensive to deconstruct, and occupying valuable land? Is, is Detroit the model of the future? I think this is one of the biggest challenges facing is how do we, how do we really take recycling to heart and learn how to do this? This is what I talked about, at the, mentioned at the beginning of the talk, is not just a and B, but the path between A and B. So what we face is community reskilling, and Ali mentioned some of this too. In fact, <laughs> a better list of resources than I've got. That we need to make information available with uh, websites, online library, plans, etc., for things that you can do, seminars. And then there's the Prius effect. Uh, there's a phenomenon among Prius drivers that they have a little con control panel that says how much energy they are, they're using and uh, how much energy they've used and people view it as a little video game. They say, well, how much can I get to work using a little bit less energy this time? And then they start posting these things on, uh, <laughs> on blogs and such. And so getting the social effect is, can be enormously powerful, not just for bragging rights, but for also learning new ways of doing things. It's like cook sharing recipes. We need to create incentives. And these are difficult things. They'll create tax incentives while they're boring but powerful um, that if you if there's tax incentives to install uh, renewable energy sources at home um, or to invest in renewable energy sources yes that's very good it's it's kind of boring it doesn't doesn't it's not visually appealing it's an invisible thing but tax incentives basically how you keep score in the game can make an enormous difference laws such as Kyoto Protocols are very slow but very essential. Um, writing, writing to your congressman can, can make a difference. Um, and then empowerment, literally, are the physical energy solutions that uh, we've mentioned. Um, social solutions are energy co-ops, micro utilities, and to leverage social networks. And I think Ali mentioned more of these things or in more detail than I did here. So the question is, um, why didn't you go into more nuclear or small-scale community plants. Um, I mentioned micro-utilities in the sense that where you might have com uh, community co-ops generate or own their own electricity. And uh, an example, here, here's maybe an example of a community thing that's neither electricity from far away nor electricity from your house. Let's say you had 100 acres of solar panels uh, on the UCSC campus. And uh, for energy storage, what they did is that they would pump water. If you were generating excess electricity, you would pump water uphill to a reservoir at the top of the campus. And then if you needed it, for instance, at night, you would let it run down through a, a turbine that would generate electricity. And then this 
this water would not be used, it would just be moved back and forth. So that would be a community utility, sort of small scale power generation that might be owned by thousands or tens of thousands of people. And that's how the capital would be raised to build it and those people would also share in the benefits. How much elevation would you need to be efficient in something like that? Uh, the general consensus is about 300 to 600 meters, so 1,000 to 2,000 feet. And the head is, um, I think the top of UCSC is 12 or 1,300 feet, so it's in the range if you were to go there down to the ocean. Also, the hills outside of Watsonville give you about 1,500 feet of, of vertical relief. Considering the energy costs of production, is ethanol viable? Well, this is where system science comes in a great deal, because what are the costs? So is the cost of how much it costs to buy the corn? Is it the cost of topsoil depletion? Is it the cost of um, raising food prices at the expense of creating, you know, now, now you've created this market where food and energy are directly competing against each other. What are the unintended consequences of that? Um, <clears throat> I think that it may be a stopgap measure in the United States. I don't think it's possible to produce enough transportation fuel that way worldwide. I think in terms of transportation, what we need to figure out is how to uh, use it more efficiently and use less. So that might mean traveling slower in carbon fiber aircraft. It might mean um, train trips instead of car trips. It might mean um, another example for cars might be the reason that cars are so heavy and inefficient is that they have to be engineered to run into each other. Uh, if technology gets good enough, perhaps cars can be much lighter because they don't have to be designed to run into each other. That could be an enormous energy savings, which might make the difference allowing batteries to jump the gap and make it possible to power them realistically. We've had meetings to talk about what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to leave a lot. Of, the best part is actually you folks having questions and discussions with us, uh, and we conspire to uh, reskill our community, as, as Bruce was just saying. Uh, and in fact, I was lucky on the plane coming back from uh, the desert to uh, sit next to an old friend of mine, Mary Tucker, who is the city energy manager for the city of San Jose. And she's been doing solar longer than anybody else. And uh, we talked about uh, some great projects they have going on over there, which we ought to get things like that going on here in Santa Cruz. They are going to be doing massive group purchasing of this still fairly expensive solar technology for homeowners. And they've organized all this. And we've got a few things like that here in Santa Cruz, but nothing like what they have going in there in San Jose. So it was interesting to learn about that. Uh, one of the websites, websites she told me about is sunshares.com. They have a way of uh, getting people to invest in these group purchasing to get major price reductions on uh, renewable energy systems. Um, but um, I thought, well, we ought to go back to the basics here, get to the roots of uh, this wonderful solar resource that runs the world. And actually, uh, you there in the second row, you had a question about nuclear. I think you were asking if he was going to talk about nuclear. My line on that is we have all the nuclear energy we need in that big wireless fusion power plant in the sky, an average distance of 93 million miles away. And uh, we don't need uranium plutonium based nuclear fission at all despite what conventional wisdom tells you and we can get into that more in the questions and answers that's not what i'm here to talk to you about but if you want to get into the details we can do that uh, i want to show you the the basics of the resource the solar <coughs> resource here this is the piece de resistance <laughs> this is a model of the arcs of the sun in the sky on key days of the year the solstices and the equinoxes this outlines what we call the solar window. And this is just a real basic thing to sort of help promote sky awareness. And it's also something which various variants of this can be used quantitatively to help you decide for a given site where you'd want to do solar, how much shade are you going to get? You know, how, how much of the percentage of the theoretical maximum solar that you could get there, uh, given the weather and your latitude, are you really going to get given buildings and hills and trees that are around? So here's the deal. This complete ring here, I have a second cousin in Virginia who's a master woodworker. I sent him, I mathematically calculated all the dimensions and everything and designed this and sent him the model. And he put this together and I wanted to be able to take this on an airplane and assemble it and disassemble it at both ends so it all screws together in nice little partial arcs. But this full ring is your horizon, your local horizon. So what you do is you get inside of this thing, or you can, you put it around at eye level. 
And then this cage of three partial rings, the middle one is the sun's path in the sky on both equinoxes. It's the same on both equinoxes, the March and September equinox. These two outer ones are the paths on the solstices. Okay, so the only difference, depending anywhere on the world that you are, the only difference in what the sun does over the course of the year is simply the tilt of this cage. So let me see if I can model this here. <clears throat> like a headset for a space cadet or something. Um, if you're on the equator, the sun rises straight up out of the eastern horizon and sets straight down at perpendicular angle to the horizon. So let me show you what it would be like on the equator. You could put a little uh, toy soldier here or something, which would be the person you know, on the ground. And this is that person's horizon. So that person would be looking up at these arcs. Every day the sun travels an arc parallel to one of these key arcs and it just shifts over slightly from day to day. What the sun does is it winds its way through the sky during the course of a year is like the parallel winds of a slinky. It's a, it's a tightly wound spiral. It spirals its way around the sky. So if we're here, what latitude are we at here? About 37 degrees north. You simply tilt this pattern at an angle from the vertical equal to your latitude. So if we're looking south that way towards those guys, Ollie and Bruce, we just tilt this 37 degrees from the vertical towards the south. Notice that the sun is never directly overhead here, even though it's close to it at the winter solstice. I mean, if I get the right angle here, this will be just about 13 degrees south of straight overhead for us. In fact, an interesting question you can ask your most intelligent and well-educated friends, disarmingly simple question that almost nobody knows the answer to is, what are the tropics? You, know, you have a globe, you got the equator, you got the Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. What are the tropics? What are those lines there for? It's simply the zone on the Earth's surface where the sun can be seen directly overhead. And we're not in the tropics, so the sun's never overhead here. Anyway, interesting little party fact for you. <clears throat> but so, okay, so this is how the sun goes here on the equinoxes. Here it is on the solstices, summer and winter. And these are 23 and a half degrees. Each of the solstice lines is 23 and a half degrees off from the equinox line. So that's 23 and a half times two. That means, and this is the whole reason for the seasons, at its highest point every day, when the sun is due south, by the way, everywhere north of the tropics, the sun is at its highest when it's due south every single day. We call that solar noon not really clock noon. It depends on where you are in the time zone, whether you have daylight savings time or not. But anyway, on the winter solstice, the sun's highest point is 47 degrees, 23 and a half times two, lower than it is at its highest point on the summer solstice. That's huge. 47 degree difference. So this swath, here's what a friend of mine calls solar tai chi. If you're scouting out a site for solar, you can sort of basically say, where's the sun going to be in the sky? goes like this, you know. So this swath of sky that the sun moves through is 47 degrees wide from winter arcs to summer arcs. So, and then, by the way, just for fun, what does it do on the poles? What does it do on the North Pole? Well, the North Pole's latitude is 90 degrees, right? Well, what's 90 degrees from vertical? It's horizontal. So here's what happens. <clears throat> on the North Pole, on the equinoxes, the sun's crawling around the horizon all day as it's slowly rising or setting, depending on which equinox it is. The next day, let's say we're moving into summer, it's a little bit higher. Next day, a little bit higher. <clears throat> so it's going all the way around the horizon, parallel to the horizon. Finally, on the summer solstice, June 21st, at the North Pole, the sun's 23 and a half degrees above the horizon all day long. It goes around like that. Then it starts going down. And then, after the September equinox, it's below the horizon for half a year. Three months heading down, three more months coming back up. Interesting little fact for you is that, this is kind of surprising, everywhere on the Earth, the total amount of time that the sun is above the horizon is the same, the total fraction. It's exactly half the year. On the pole, it's up 24-7 for half the year and down 24-7 for half the year. On the equator, it's up half of every single day of the whole year. Here and everywhere else, it's up, you know, longer in the summer, down shorter in the summer, and then vice versa in the winter. And it ends up being up half the time. Now you have a little bit of difference because, because of atmospheric refraction, which causes you to see the sun a little bit before it's really up and causes you to see it a little bit after it's really down, but forget about that. 
So anyway, okay, so there's just a little basic tutorial on the basis for what is by far the dominant energy source on the planet. The sun and all of its derivative energy resources, uh, wind, biofuels, wave, and tidal. Well, tidal is lunar power, but I call it all sky power. So uh, it uh, completely dwarfs the sum total of everything we'll ever get from oil, coal, gas, and uranium combined. This is actually the best kept secret in the world. You never hear this. <laughs> so we need to uh, get on with uh, using it. And it's going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard. But uh, as we say, if we do it in community groups and uh, support each other, uh, we, can, we can get there. And uh, we just need to really know that it's possible. And uh, hey, well, so now <laughs> I'm going to introduce the stuff, the actual materials, the miracle crystals, the magic crystals of the new millennium for photovoltaics, just as one example. Photo photovoltaics means light, as in photo, from electricity, you know, like volts, the, full, the, the forcefulness of electricity. Brought along my little bag of tricks here. I teach hands-on, you know, design and installation classes for solar electricity at Cabrillo and uh, for various corporate and non-profit outfits around the country, like Solar Living Institute, which is affiliated with Real Goods. And, um, okay, here's an old radio, and we're going to make this radio go. Now, the thing that's nice about it being cloudy today, other than the fact that it's a welcome relief for me from the uh, heat of the Arizona desert, is that uh, it'll be really impressive that we can power this radio on a cloudy day with these solar cells, solar modules. These are made of the second most abundant element on the Earth's crust. You know, there are two things that I tell people when we talk about energy crisis and, you know, how we're going to get our energy. Okay, number one, we have 10,000 times the energy we need pouring in from the sun. Every hour we get enough to power all of humanity's needs for a year. Every hour enough comes in to supply everything we need for a year. Now, hey, maybe only a hundredth of that is practically exploitable. Well, we still got 100 times what we need. <laughs> hey, I'll take 10. But anyway, okay, the second fact is, okay, with these photovoltaics, well, this is made of the stuff that that valley over the hill is named for. You know, the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust, silicon, rocks. Rocks are silicates. And they've been around for billions of years, and uh, these things last for a really long time. <laughs> Um, they're warrantied for 25 years. You tell me any other consumer product you can get that has that good a warranty on it, and they last for much longer. Um, so th the performance degrades a little bit. You know, it's like a fraction of a percent per year, but that's all known when you buy it, and that's all represented fairly by decent solar manufacturers. So, okay, let's, let's do this radio thing here. These are fun little fans that you can just power. You know, you can hook this thing up. The, the light here um, is not enough, actually. It seems really bright, but it's nothing compared to the sun, even on a cloudy day. So uh, you can power these things directly with these. They're fun, and you know, it's kid stuff, and I'm sure it's kid stuff for most of you, but hey, I love it. And everybody has to feel that fan vibrate when the solar panel gets hooked up to it. But the, the really fun thing is going to be to power this radio. So uh, I took out the, uh, the place where the batteries would normally go. It's back here. And uh, it's got an AC and a DC mode. It's got a switch here that says AC. So let's check it with AC first. Make sure we've got a good station. I think I got it tuned to KPIG 107 Oink 5. We'll probably get a commercial, but let's just see what we get if I plug it into the wall. So I got to make sure. Okay, the other setting is BAT, B A T T. What's that for? That's for batteries. Well, they generate direct current. So do. So do PV, photovoltaic solar modules. They, direct, they, they generate direct current. To run your home circuits, typically, which run on AC, alternating current, you need a device called an inverter. These things are getting really efficient, and they're pretty amazing, black magic. But an interesting question is, in the future, we might actually be able to save a fair amount of energy if we were start running more of our things on direct current, you know, get back to the days of direct current appliances. And after all, this computer with these marvelous PowerPoints runs on direct current. So first we invert the DC power that our solar cells make to AC, and then you got to have a little box on your computer there on the wire that rectifies it back to DC. So, you know, an increasing fraction of our loads are, are direct current, so maybe we should reconsider how much of our infrastructure is going to be alternating versus direct. But anyway, little details. So right now I'm going to switch it to AC just so I can plug it into the wall, and we'll make sure it's running here. I have it on tape, so I'm 
I'm going to switch it to radio now. We're inside a we're inside a building here. Eh, that's good enough. It shows you we got some juice anyway. Okay, so now before I forget, so I don't fry the radio. Although I think I've done it accidentally, and it doesn't really matter. But I'm going to switch it to BAT, B A T T, because the solar cells div generate DC electricity. Okay, now we can put this away. We don't need no wall plug. We're going to plug this into the sun. So, here's the deal. Uh, actually, we could even have some volunteers build us a little 9-volt power plant, which is what we need. This thing requires 9 volts. Now, okay, how many 1.5-volt batteries would be needed when wired in series, where you add the voltage? 6. 6 times 1.5 is 9. These are little 3-volt solar panels. So how many of these do I need in series? When you, when you wire things in series, you add the voltage. Okay, so three. We can probably even get away with two, actually. But um, we will do this. I, I'm just going to go ahead and do it, and then afterwards we can all play around if anybody wants to. But uh, I'll just show you how we do this. So each of these is three volts. And, uh, okay, so series. Well, positive to negative, positive to negative. And, you know, I mean, we just by convention call the red the positive and the black the negative. We don't have to pay too much attention to the colors. And I brought wires of all different colors. And, hey, we'll just sling it together here. You all can be my quality control people. Make sure I'm doing it right. I actually tested this before I came over here because it was so cloudy. I thought, geez, maybe it won't work. But, hey, it does. So that's great. Okay. So, okay, we take the, the red of this one. These little clips here. We call them alligator clips. I was working with a French guy at NASA once who called them crocodile clips. Anyway, <laughs> hook those together. And then this one will go to the black of a different solar panel. Yeah, Bruce mentioned NASA there, uh, I think, didn't you? At some point, I, I worked at NASA Ames Research Center for years studying the ozone layer in the polar stratosphere. Also on a flying observatory for infrared astronomy. You have to get above the water vapor in the atmosphere, which filters out the invisible infrared from stars being born and things like that. And, um, but I got kind of tired of studying climate change over there, too, but I got kind of tired of studying problems and wanted to move on to working on the solutions and you know, training the green workforce for the future. So that's what I'm involved with now. It's a little hard to make it pay, but anyway, I'm still working on that. So, okay, so what do we got here? We got red to black, and now red to black of another one. I'm going to end up with one free red end that I'm going to stick into that radio. Okay, so here we go. Okay, now I'm also going to end up with one free black end. And the radio has a, a spring. You know which end of a battery is the negative end? It's the flat end, right? So that's the one that goes against the spring. Well, I have a this wire tied onto a spring in here. So this will go to our free negative end. Actually, maybe I could use a hand from somebody. You want to come up and do this? I'm going to need somebody to carry this little power plant out with me anyway. So, okay, here we go. Thank you. Do a little alligator, a crocodile dance there. Okay, so now, uh, what's your name, by the way? Alan. Alan? Joe, nice to meet Hi, you. <laughs> so if um, we could just go ahead and carry this whole assembly out, and we can verify once we get out there that it's all wired correctly and the connections haven't come loose, we'll go ahead and fire up this radio. The only thing that remains to be done now is uh, I have to, you know, touch that red, that free red end into the little plate inside the radio where the little nub positive end of the batteries goes. And we'll play music for a minute or two, and then we can come back in here and have, have some questions and answers. The order of the leads, the uh, fan will go in the opposite direction. Yeah, on your radio? Sure, thank you. Oh, All right. Oh, there we go, there we go. Oh, I just turned it over. Look at that, it's running even with this thing down. Just the light reflecting off the sidewalk is enough to power this fan. Now I do this, it's really going. Yeah, I see. So, oh yeah, so you're it's, showing It's a out. challenge to get it going as slow day. as we can without it stopping. Look at that, it's just yeah. going off the reflected light off right. my shirt, but finally. <laughs> Lower the amperage, it runs slower. So now, which way is it going now? It's clearly going it counter clockwise, counter right? Yeah, it's going okay, now let's reverse the leads, and it'll go the other way, just to uh, let's see here. Here we go, so now. 
the yellow ones are the black. Yeah, we got it. Oops. Actually, these things have little tabs on it. We don't even need the extra little wires. There we go. Cooperative effort here. There we go. Oh, no, no, let's see which way we're going now. It was counterclockwise before, right? Now it's clockwise. Goes the other way. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, you get the yeah. idea. Physical law don't change it's, it's at all. It's fun. Every, everybody should feel this. Every, pass this motor around. Everybody should it's feel the, the life in that feel, thing. Oh, I see. Feel, I Doesn't that feel cool? Oh, yeah. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> Kids can right. take this. They're trying to give me yeah. a haircut. Wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow, that's, that's quite a bit. Wow. Woo! Don't fly away now. <laughs> okay, electric aviation solved. <laughs> There are some issues. The efficiencies of the tin film right now is not as good as silicon, uh, but I think the cost eventually will be more important. The second part is the materials used in a lot of the tin films are not very you know, friendly um, for environment, uh, so cadmium, uh, tellurium, and so on. Um, and for uh, those reasons, there have been discussions of, you know, you're cr producing clean energy, but the actual uh, cells themselves are hazardous. Uh, so the uh, First Solar, the company is selling them, uh, now has a program to take them back and kind of recycle them. So the idea is that if you're careful how to deal with it, uh, you don't have to worry. Of course, if you throw it away and you have uh, uh, toxic material will be an issue. So I guess basically when the efficiency is lower, you have to cover more area, but a lot of the infrastructure costs go up with the area. You need support and other things. Mm -hmm. um, so the, you cannot go too much uh, lower in the efficiency. But there are people who are working now on polymer, yeah. paint type solar cells and these are research type yeah. and they're saying that the efficiency is low but it's so cheap it's almost like painting and maybe at some point uh, you can paint your houses yeah. Um, yeah. and get electricity. By the way I have a, something I, I got to bring up here because it's maybe some news to you. I just learned this this morning. Actually there's two things I want to tell you. Just learned this morning that the Chinese have just um, uh, Hu Jintao, the, the premier over there, has just said, that, you know, they were going to go this great leap forward on nuclear. And they've pretty much decided now in the wake of the Fukushima thing that they are going to make instead the great leap forward in solar. And they're going to like pour a trillion and a half mm -hmm. into the development of solar. And that is good news for the world because that's exactly the kind of thing we've been needing <laughs> in spades is major investment research and development to finally get the cost down and you know make up for the huge largesse and pork that's been lavished on you know conventional energies over the past decades the other thing is by the way though champion of solar though i am i am a big opponent of the world's largest solar plant which is being proposed for our backyard two hours from here down in the panoche valley beautiful piece of country and it's prime agricultural land and this company that's never done solar before and they failed in everything else they've done uh, is trying to get u.s stimulus dollars for taiwanese investors and photovoltaics manufacturers and put slap up this big photovoltaics plant down there in the panoche valley so keep an eye on that one the name of the company is solar gen but i heard they already sold it off to somebody else and it's just this big scam. And, you know, if we're going to do solar, let's do it right. And let's give solar a good reputation. The question is, um, sometimes there is too much wind and they actually have to stop wind turbines. Uh, and they, the problem is the grid capacity is reached. Uh, the issue is that we don't have a way for to store the electricity. So what happened is that if there is too much wind and this um, uh, the electricity generated is not used, it cannot work. Actually, it uh, affects other uh, devices connected to the grid. So they, what they do is that they actually have to turn off the wind turbines. Um, so, so what in some countries like in Denmark they are doing uh, mm -hmm. is that uh, in the northern Europe they are connected to the grid to Norway and Sweden and Norway and Sweden have a lot of hydroelectric and what they do is okay when you have a place where you have rivers and reservoirs you use the excess to pump water and um, uh, store the energy in the uh, water in an elevation. Um, I guess we have uh, the reservoir, which is just south of uh, 152, um, uh, San, Luis. San, Luis San Luis Reservoir, is actually, we are using it for storage for that purpose as well. Mm -hmm. But the idea is right now, uh, in countries like Denmark, is only up to 20% of their energy is coming from the renewables, especially wind. 
if we want to go to the level of 50% and higher, then it becomes real an issue because we don't have that many reservoirs and that's the problem that they're working to see how they could accommodate. Basically, the places that they have seen huge increase, like Germany, they, there's government uh, that they have agreed the payback price for the next 20 years or whatever it is. So that's the reason there is so much investment because government have guaranteed. But your question, so I think that the real concrete issue, if they don't guarantee it, then how can you get a loan and what happens if there are issues uh, and I don't know if you have anything to a lot of the questions end up not being technical but financial mm -hmm. that Political. people want not just returns on their money but they want stable returns on their money they want to be able to count on a certain amount per year and the issue with renewable energy is that it's more intermittent and so there's going to have to be a new approach to risk management uh, how these things are invested and uh, what kind of financial vehicles are created for this.